Hello and welcome to another great um, John Plampin by Thomas Gainsborough Diary Master Painting. Yes, I hope you have fun with this one. I've got a lot of information to tell you today. Okay, so I'm continuing to work on um, the the painting. Um, I'm leaving the figure and the dog until last. I just want to work basically on the um, the ground and the surrounding areas. I want to build a little bit more into the trees and I want to do a little bit more into the ground around John and the dog's feet. But as you can see, I'm putting a glaze of raw sienna now onto the tree trunk. So I'm trying to build the colour up now. I've got my um, underpainting done, I think. Um, this all could change as I said this is just a trial and error process but I'm going to try and build up the colour now actually on the tree and um, then I stand up with my big belly showing <laughs> so I just wanted to talk a little bit about paint today um, as I'm doing this so just watch the processes um, and, and I'll keep coming back and forth to the video so um, I want to talk about ingredients of colour paint of ingredients of, of colour in the paint <laughs> I'm uh, reading my notes. Um, the colour hue of the paint, which comes from its pigment, is mixed with other basic ingredients. So Jason uses oils. Um, he's using water mixable oils, but they're basically made the same way. They've just got an ingredient in them to allow the water to bond with the paint. So basically oil paint is a combination of three things. Pigment, linseed oil and turpentine. The pigment provides the colour. The linseed oil is the binder which holds the pigment together and um, that is the ingredient that um, helps the the spread of the paint onto the canvas or the board whatever support you're going to be painting on and the turpentine is the thinner so the ingredients that thins the oil um, and uh, basically makes it easy to apply with a brush on oil paint may contain other oils like poppy seed or walnut and provided they are um, Sicative oils, so that means they're oils that dry dry by oxidization. Um, there we go. Now the point is, unlike most other paints, oils do not dry by evaporation, but but the result of oxidization. Uh, the oil reacts with oxygen in the air and turns it into gel and then into a solid. So unlike um, acrylics, which evaporate during the air, oils basically um, oxidize. So they they. They dry out with oxygen in the air, so they turn like a jelly, like a sticky, and then they just dry into um, a solid. Then, uh, watercolors, watercolors, and uh, uh, gouache paints. Uh, technically, watercolor is any medium, paint medium soluble in water, like a uh, tempera, a gouache. Um, here, however, watercolor refers to the technique of painting with washes of color as developed in England during the 18th and 19th century. Basically, this type of watercolour paint consists of pigment colour and gum arabic, mm. a water-soluble binder, to which is added the grosh. Um, um, it, it, the grosh is, a, is, a, is, a, is a, um, um, an opaque watercolour paint. There we go, an opaque watercolour paint. Uh, that's created by adding materials such as talc, zinc, um, uh, China clay, uh, tempera consists of pigment, uh, which is a colour, egg yolk, the binder, to which um, to which water is added then. So you can use egg white, can't you, if you think about it. A tempera consists of a colour or a pigment. Um, you, can, you can make your own tempers quite easily. Okay, oh, I'm not confusing this. What am I doing here now? I'm just putting some highlights on these, um, on these roots. As you can see, I'm developing the shapes of those roots. Not 100% accurate to the, the photograph, but who minds? When this is actually viewed from a distance, it doesn't really matter. All I'm doing is just trying to get the the uh, the basic feel about this painting. I'm trying to put in some more um, highlights now on the on the trunk, just to develop that shape, a rounded shape is what I'm trying to get at there. Uh, let's go to my favourite medium, acrylics, which is what I'm using in in this particular painting. Um, I'm just watching my time. How am I doing? I'm okay. <laughs> 
This is a wholly synthetic painting medium based on acrylic, acrylic polymer resin and comes with a wide variety of finishes. In its simplest form, acrylic paint consists of pigment, which is the colour, inside an emulsion of an acrylic polymer, which is plastic, and resins, the binder, and water. The combination of pigments and plastic resin dries to an extremely quick by evaporation of the water and other solvents it contains to form a tough, flexible film. Now, I've also been asked um, a question um, by uh, one of you lovely subscribers out there, and um, and that is, um, do all um, paint pigments behave in the same way? So I can simply answer that in one second. I'm just having a look at the monitor to see what I'm doing. And um, yes, I'm just, what am I doing? I don't know. I'm just... Deciding what to do, I think, picking up the next colour. Yeah, so as I do that, let's have a, let's answer this question. So quite simply, no. Um, acrylic paint is the fastest drying and its colour changes slightly as it dries. So it can dry up to two shades darker, if you think about it. Okay, so that, that's one. Watercolour is also quite fast drying and watercolours also change hue during their drying process. So they can change. Not, no exact ratios on that. In contrast, oil paint dries much more slowly. And its hue does not change. Hmm. Moreover, as it dries, more paint can be added to create uh, exceptionally rich colours. These attributes of workability and the, the lush tone of colour makes oil paints the preferred choice by most master painters. Um, so you, you can just keep building, building and, and increasing that colour depth. And, and this is what I'm trying to replicate actually um, during this painting is... Uh, as these they were all painted in oils, um, they got that luster look about them, and I am trying to do exactly the same thing. So I'm using small dabs of paint now, uh, which I mixed some um, a Mars black, which has got blue in it. I don't use um, straight blacks like carbon blacks and lamp blacks, which are very very black blacks. I use I tend to use blue blacks, um, or a, a purpley blue black. Um, I, I put some dioxazine purple in my blacks, so I don't I don't necessarily use a a, a, a a true black black. I always use blacks that are slightly cooler, um, and I'll, I'll show you how to mix some um, shadow colours um, later on. So I mix some um, um, cadmium yellow medium, I think, with this black um, to give me a green. That's my preferred way of making greens. Actually, in actual fact, I mentioned that before. I just like the way the greens turn out. So just using the dabbing motion like I presume that um, Thomas Gainsborough did on these uh, leaves and just building the foliage up there and they're going to have several different layers of um, greens and contrasting greens on them before uh, I finish. So what are uh, pigments? Pigments, um, okay, pigments and dyes are the ingredients that uh, impart colour the paint. So pigments and dyes go into the paint to colour it. That's the colour. So colour green is a green pigment or a mixture of blue and yellow pigment. But um, the word uh, colourant is commonly used for both dyes and other dye stuff. Pigments, well, the basic difference between pigments and dyes is solubility. Their ability to dissolve in water. Whereas dye is or can be made soluble, a pigment tends to be more insoluble. Thus, must be um, ground into a fine powder and then um, thoroughly mixed with a with a carrier liquid such as oil or water, or before before being applied. And um, pigments can be made from dyes via special processes. <laughs> this is not easy. I write it out. It looks good, and then I go to say it, and it sounds complicated. <laughs> so basically. Um, the, the pigment is 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 is, is got to be pummeled pummeled there's a pummel they just grind it down like into a very 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 fine powder like that and then mix it in to the carrier something like the linseed oil or whatever or poppy seed or walden oil and then that is used then um with the turpentine and then applied to the canvas um, whereas a dye is a dye basically it just colors everything doesn't it whereas a pigment uh, it's got to be carried but it's got to be mixed into a it's got to be pummeled down to a fine powder Okay, I'm just looking at some questions. Uh, 
Uh, this is this is a note that I wrote. Um, oh, I, I picked up um, for information and I've just written it down quickly. So colour painting during the 17th and 18th century, which is quite apt for what we're doing here with the old Thomas Gainsborough. And again, I'm adding some greens around the foot of that tree by the looks of it. Uh, after the Renaissance period, um, this approach to fine art painting was adopted by the major European academies and became enriched in the style known as academic art. Painting was not even the, the, the colloquium of most academies. Students had to learn painting skills um, with their masters, basically. Um, and the, and the colour continued to have a secondary function as more supportive elements during the um, Baroque period, such as Rubin, um, attracted criticism for his dramatic use of pigments, while, um, while it was revealed that an exemplar of more balanced colorism was evolving. Um, that, not evolving, but it was there. So, you know, the bright use of colors during this period was like, ooh, you know, what, what, what's going on? <laughs> It's a bit of a shock. It's like it's like moving into the um, moving into the, um, the the technical era, isn't it, with iPhones and things like that, when everybody's been used to putting money in the slots and, and picking up a phone. <laughs> What's this new new thing? We don't like it. <laughs> Nobody likes change. You certainly don't. But um, a, a, a century or so later, the same debate erupted over respective color practices um, by the the romantic painters. Um, so um, one of the cardinal principles of academic painting um, concerned the principle um, of the primacy of the uh, uh, naturalistic palette. Colours were to reflect natural colours found in nature. This grass was green, the sea was blue, the skin was flesh coloured and the situa situation uh, endured then until the 19th century when a res revolution, a revolution occurred and um, no major new colours were discovered in the, in, in the 17th century, but Prussian blue was produced during the 18th century, uh, as were several new cobalt and chrome colours. For example, um, you know, you, you, we found the Prussian blues and the cobalts and, and that then. So I don't exactly I have to do a bit of research on them, wouldn't I? And then Impressionism came along and blew it all out the water. So instead of the sky being blue, who's yellow? <laughs> instead of the grass being green, it was blue. And uh, well, that's another story. Perhaps we'll do a Monet or or something like that um, later on, Jason. But yes, I'm waffling now. So what am I doing now? I've just built a, um, a bit of shadow around these stones. Um, and I do p like passing information on like this. I certainly do. I think it's important that we we learn as we paint. And this is this to this this painting has become more of a master class. Um, not just for myself, but for you as well, because um, the, the nature of this painting is it takes so long. It's taking so long. I couldn't basically just do this from start to finish um, in, 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 in the detail I want to do it. I could do it within about four hours, I think, um, but that's not going to benefit anybody really, is it? You know, we can, we can all paint pretty pictures, but we need to learn the basics. And what Jason and I are trying to do here is teach you the basics as well. And not just the basics, but the the fundamental principles of art, whereas we can create wonderful works of art and not just pretty pictures. And I think painting pretty pictures is a good start, but it's certainly not where um, we need to go as far as art is concerned. So some of us want to sit down and paint um, portraits of animals and um, dogs and cats and lions and leopards, which is fantastic. Um, and that's that's the skills you can learn on this particular thing you can take into that portraits again is another area we can look at um but you know if 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 we just want to learn then painting anything and i and i suggest you paint anything from landscapes to skies to seascapes to people for dogs butterflies um fun colorful paintings um Anything you want, just get that brush on that canvas. Put your energy into it. And above all, above all, of confidence. Don't knock yourself. Don't think, I can't do this. It's rubbish. It looks terrible. Everybody, everybody learns from trying. Everybody learns from doing. Everybody, everybody started from just picking up the brush for the first time. And Charlie Chaplin said that... Um, we never become masters until we pass away. <laughs> so we never, we're not masters of our arts until we're gone, basically. So we always continually 
learning, continually processing, continually in, in, in just building our skills. And this is what this is showing to showing me. Um, this particular painting is it, it it's it's making me think, making me use more learning along the way. And if we make a mistake, um, as Bob Ross used to say, they all sometimes they're happy accidents, sometimes they're absolutely natural disasters. Trust me. But the good thing is we can always recover from that. Not only can we overpaint, not only can we, if, if it's acrylics, we can dry it off and overpaint it. If it's oil paintings, we can scrape it off and start again. And we learn by that mistake. We won't do it again. And if we did, we'll, we'll know how to recover it. So that's that's the good thing about these lessons it's, it, it, that it shows. So I'm just going to play a little bit of music now and um, we'll have a little chat just later on uh, about this.
<clears throat> and I'm back. Yeah, so um, just wanted to play a little bit of music, just watching me paint away the stress of everyday life and um, just putting in the, the first little bit of detail, which I'm so excited about. Yeah, I love detail. This is where this painting is going to absolutely jump out the canvas and come to life. Especially when we paint old John by there. And I've got to redraw John. Anyway, I just want to talk very quickly about palette paints. Yeah, palette. Paints in my palette. Yes. Also known as setting up your palette in the same way every time. It's important. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a master of not doing that because I'm painting so many different paintings. And I just happen to pick the colours that I want to use. But I should set up my palette like I normally do when I'm doing my commission work. And I set it up exactly the same every time. Now this can lead you down the path of colour chaos if you don't do that. Because consistently looking at your palette for a specific colour. Where's my blue? Where's my yellow? Where's my green? <laughs> but if you know what it is, it makes life a lot easier. And you can accidentally dip your brush into the wrong paint, can't you? You know, you think, oh, my blue is normally there, but it's not. I put yellow there. No, <laughs> I've got to wash my brush and do it again. So um, it, can, it, it can actually put a damper on your painting process, can't it? So if, if you're painting, um, what I recommend you do is just put your pet colours normally where you put them. Um, I don't do that during lessons, and I should. I'm going to start practising what I preach. This also allows you to work faster as well, so you don't really, really need to think where your paint is. Um, um, I know where all my paint is in my drawers. Even if electricity drops and I'm in the dark, if I wanted to pick up a tube of red, I got a rough idea where what drawer that red is in and roughly where that red is. <laughs> so it should be the same, shouldn't it, with your palette. If you want to know where that blue is, you should know where that blue is. Um, mud. Mud. They say turning your paint into mud, also known as mixing too many colours in one. Yes, to avoid muddy hues, try sticking to only two or three colours. And also don't over mix your pigments. As soon as you see the colour you want, stop mixing. Yes, stop mixing. Um, I, I'm a dirty painter, you know. I, 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 if I'm using a light colour, I'll mix and paint and I'll go into a darker colour. If I'm using several different types of blue, you'll see that I'll go from a, a lightish blue into a darkish blue if I'm using the same brush. And before we go, let's let's just finish off don't go also known as painting too far away from the subject of a still life make sure you are no more than two to three yards away from your subject when painting a still life likewise if you're right-handed place your still life on your left so your arm doesn't block your view and vice versa for left-handers so there's a little tip for you there have i got time for another one i ask myself <laughs> let's have a little look what i'm doing here I'm actually working on his socks. Now, his socks are white, or basically an off-white. Um, but what, what am I doing? I'm actually painting his socks blue. Why am I painting his blue? Well, true white, if you look at anything, true white is a mixture of colour. It's not just pure white. Um, it reflects white. Pure white reflects colour. So in this particular instance, I'm putting some blue down. And um, I'm going to build the white and the tones of white on top of that. So I need to go in with a blue colour in order to show the white. It's like painting darks. When we're going to paint a dark foliage and we increase the contrast into greens, we show we put the dark down to show light. And it's the same with white. It certainly is. So that's why I'm painting his socks white. <laughs> Not that he got white socks. I don't wear white socks with shoes. It doesn't look right. <laughs> Especially with flip-flops. <laughs> It's getting hot in here. Yes, also known as storing art materials in a warm area. When it comes to storage, keep completed work as works and work. Work works <laughs> works in progress and your materials in a cool, dry area away from light. It also advisable um, I advise you to store your work in a relatively dust free space because particles can stick to wet paint and ruin uh, your textured service. So if you're using oils, um, I don't know what Jason does, I'll have to ask him. Um, but I know that um, a lot of oil painters has, have a drying wall and they hang their paintings up on a wall so it's f f to allow them to dry before they can go on to the next stage. I'm not too sure what Jason does, I'll have to ask him. Now I'm getting bored, also known as neglecting to add a focal point. Many beginning painters tend to think too much about their accuracy and not enough about the alluring, more dynamic qualities of their art. So use a viewfinder. Yes, one of those little paper things. I, I made a video on one of them once. 
I don't know where it is. It must be on in my 400 odd video somewhere. <laughs> if you're overwhelmed by a scene in front of you, make sure to determine what your focal point is before starting out in the next art piece. So get a bit of paper, a bit of card, cut the square out, roughly the same size as your you know, a canvas, whether it's a landscape or portrait, and just hold it up if you're, if you're painting up outside or something like that. Or if you're using Photoshop or something, crop down the image. Try and think where your eye is going to be going. Think of focal, focal points. Um, you can have multiple focal points, but when you're starting out, it's better just to have one focal, 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 focal point. <laughs> focal point. <laughs> oh, dear me. So do you think paint grows on trees? Um, also known as wasting paint. You can find ways to save your art materials, particularly any medium. Uh, oil painting palettes, for example, can be stored in the freezer with extends their long activity. For watercolors, try a palette with a lid. When the paint is unused, um, uh, paint will dry on the palette, but it can be packed away easily and safely when you're ready to paint again or just add water. Now, also with acrylics, you can use um, a wet palette like I'm using you on this uh, master painting and I put a lid on it. Now, what I've got to say is if you, if you do use a wet palette, always leave a little gap, let the air circulate because you don't want your palette to sweat because acrylics will, are, are going to just go all runny. And if you notice your paint's gone runny because you're using a wet palette, that's because you haven't let the palette breathe. It's important to leave a little gap there. Um, just so they don't runny, go runny. And um, I've, I've had paint on my palette for, for several weeks, in fact, especially when I'm working on a commission. I've got two palettes. I've got a palette for the YouTube and I've got a palette for Clive. Yeah, I have. Because I do paint in between these paintings, believe it or not. I've got a, several sub subjects and projects on at the moment. Um, I've got other YouTube lessons. I've got this master class painting. And I've also got a commission uh, that, that I work on as well in between. So I've got several subjects going on at once. And um, I guess a bit confusing, especially for me. But I do paint away the stress of everyday life here in Wales. Um, so I'm just putting some Prussian blue down. Just added a little bit of white to that because... Um, I just want to sparkle it up a bit now. I'm going to increase the darks and shadows in there with as, um, several different tones of Prussian blue. And then I'm going to be glazing over with some vermilion. Very, 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 very similar to um, Thomas Gainsborough. That's what he did. He used red and vermilion to, to glaze over his Prussian blue on his fabric to make it look velvety. And I'm just doing a little bit of line sketching in now. Just trying to get some shape where old thomas is sitting um and i'm just going to be playing around with that for the next couple of minutes and i think i'm going to end this diary here and um, just let you watch me paint for a couple of seconds and um well thank you very much please like comment share and subscribe let me know if this information is um doing you any good <laughs> and i'm not just boring you don't forget to leave me in the comments uh, join me on um, facebook you can also um message me on uh, www.clive5art.co.uk where there's a, there's a shop there if you want to pop along and have a look also you can contact me um on patreon because for a dollar a month you can help support me because this is a public funded site where uh, patrons come along and help me support me and um just give me a little bit to help me work in the studio. Also, you can contact me on um, fly5art at yahoo.co.uk where you can drop me comments and questions. And I'm always happy to help. So you've got several different ways there to, to help me and contact me. So please do that. I'm going to carry on with John Plump in shoes now. Looks like he's been to Clark's and bought the new pair. <laughs> so I'll see you on the other one. Bye.